So I want to introduce our speaker, Michael Tesoro. He is the owner of Uma Tesoro's Tomato Sauce Marinara Sauce Company, um, which you can find at the Co-op and other places. Um, he's also on the board of Berkshires, um, like Phyllis has been in the past. Phyllis, our speaker last week. Is he a card carrying? Oh yeah. <laughs> so um, Michael is basically doing what we're, we've been talking about, just like Phyllis and uh, Maddie Elling have been. He's making things here yeah. in the Berkshires. That looks dangerous. Dangerous. <laughs> That's what I like. It's a little danger. That's so, a small jar. I'll turn it over to Michael, and he can introduce himself further. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I am not going to lecture to you about marketing. As a matter of fact, um, this is not going to be me talking about marketing at all. Uh-oh. <laughs> this is about getting you to be marketers. And marketing is about creating disruptive events. So the first thing I'd like to do to disrupt this class is for everybody to move their desks, which are <laughs> flexible, <laughs> in a circle. And I'd like you to you. <laughs> move around. <laughs> An idea of how you adapt to change. And being entrepreneurs, which you're all geared up to do, to start your own ventures, you're going to constantly be confronted with change and with disruptive events. And rather than me standing up there behind the podium <coughs> like press secretary Spicer, <laughs> does this thing move? No. I can't ram that into anybody. Um, so that's a lot, a lot better, a lot closer, because we're all kind of going to be engaged in a, more of an interactive uh, session than just me talking to you. Um, Would you like a seat at the table? This, the other thing I really want to tell you is I always wanted to be a professor. <laughs> and I haven't been a professor yet except for today. So today's my one day to be a professor. <laughs> uh, OK, so I know most of you don't have a clear picture of what it is you want to start, the business you want to start. But, does anybody have a really clear picture of exactly what kind of business they want to develop? What type of business plan? You do. So one out of how many? 20? 16. 16. Um, okay. And how many people are thinking about creating a service? We are living in a service economy. And how many are thinking of creating a product? One, two, maybe three. <laughs> and are those products physical, like something you would deliver and sell, make, manufacture? Yep. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Something you would make and manufacture, rather than a product you would deliver, say, through uh, the internet. Right? Anyone considering a virtual product of any sort? Software oriented? Potentially, yeah. <laughs> Actually, it really doesn't matter, but it's interesting to know kind of where you guys are at in terms of how you're gonna market your product uh, or service. And I really call services products too. Um, and so I could, give you a lecture about marketing, marketing 101, and uh, that'd be pretty boring. So I'd like to make this a lot more interactive, and I'd like to focus on three, maybe four things. How many of you started a lemonade stand when you were a kid? A lot. And um, so that's going to be one thing that I'd like you to remember about marketing. 
lemonade. So that, we'll get back to that in a minute. I'll have some questions for the, some of you who created those lemonade stands. But lemonade is something I want you to remember for the rest of your lives when you're about to market a product of any kind, anywhere. Think back to the lemonade stand because that will center you and get you focused on the right issues and the right questions that you have to answer about how you're gonna market your product. Lemonade. And I already, I lied to you already. We're in the age of lying, so I've already lied to you. I am gonna to talk to you about marketing a little bit. And there are only two things I think that are really important about marketing that you should remember for the rest of your life. And I wish somebody had told me when I was a little boy what they were. And it's the most fundamental thing about marketing that you should know and keep in the back of your pocket at all times. It was developed in the 1940s by a Harvard professor, somebody a lot smarter than me. Uh, I do take no credit. Has anyone heard of the four Ps? It's not a band. Okay, good. So four Ps. If my voice is beginning to crack, it's because I've been up making pasta sauce since five o'clock this morning. Four Ps. It's another one. And then the third thing is brand. And even more than, make sure I spell it right, even more than brand, it's how you value that brand, brand value. Um, but we're gonna steal something from a New York or worldwide advertising company called Young and Rubicam, YNR, and they invested millions of dollars around the world. They have offices all over the world, Tokyo, Mexico City, Rio de Janeiro, probably just because it's a cool place to visit, and why not have meetings in Rio de Janeiro? Um, they spent millions of dollars trying to figure out how you value brands and where your brand sits in the world. And so we'll talk about that a little bit. So I want to make this really simple because I can basically only remember about three things anyway. Lemonade stand, four peas, and brand. Those are the three things we're going to focus on. And um, when, you, when you're done, and we're done with that, you will be marketers. You will be able to go outside one class. We're doing this in one class. You will be able to market your product as long as you keep going back and referring to these things. And like I said, I wish somebody made it that simple for me. But you know, we could give you lots of different terms and terminology and talk about the competition and all the important things that you know, you're gonna be asked to do on this homework assignment. But when you're doing that homework assignment, I really want you to think back to the lemonade stand, four Ps, and the brand asset valuator. All right, so the people that raised their hand who, start, who actually had a lemonade stand when they were a kid, which ones were you? Don't be shy. <clears throat> All right, let's go to some of the mentors first and put some pressure on them. Okay, so tell me about your lemonade stand. It was uh, almost 65 years ago. Yeah. So I don't know if I remember. <laughs> okay. It, but it was uh, in front of my house. Yep. With a sign that said lemonade. Yep. Face towards the traffic. Yep. And uh, we waited for people to come and buy lemonade. Right. And how'd you do? 
Uh, well, I did great because I thought that everything was profit. <laughs> right. But uh, little did I know that my mother paid for the lemons right. and for the uh, juice and for the sugar and for the glasses. So, I mean, I came out Pure profit. smelling like a rose. She, 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 she funded you. Yeah. And that's interesting, too. So you used real lemons. We did. And real sugar. We did. Now, I would imagine some of you others might not have used real lemons, or maybe you did. I heard someone say Kool-Aid. Yeah. Kool-Aid. Kool-Aid. Because it was cheap? Because it was in demand? You know, a girl on the block said she's got a package of Kool-Aid, and she said, why don't you get some sugar? So I went in the house, I got sugar. Mm -hmm. My mother came home from work, she was annoyed with me because it was nine cents worth of sugar. And uh, it meant a lot then. And she said, I don't know sense. So it was a joint venture? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and well, how much did you guys sell it for? I don't remember. Probably five cents a cup or something. I don't know. And did anybody stop by? Oh, yeah. It was kids on the block. You know. Kids on the block. Lucky. They had money? I, they had nickels. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. It was ice cream money. <laughs> and ice cream. And did you have ice any cream money? <laughs> did you have any? So it was barter. So you bartered. Um, did any of you have any competition? Not at the time. Nobody set up across the street. No. <laughs> so did anybody? After they started their lemonade stand, did anybody have somebody set up shop right next door to them? Don't Here are the Berkshires. We're kind of spread out, few and far between. But um, I can remember back when I was a kid, to the time when we created a lemonade stand and we had neighbors who decided that they were going to offer a lemonade stand as well and all of a sudden we started thinking about wait a minute how could we get more customers than the neighborhood and why would somebody stop at our lemonade stand versus the next door neighbors. Right. So what are some of the things that might entice you to have customers come to your lemonade stand versus the next door neighbors, for example? Keep the price. It's all nice. Price. So location, price is a really good location. Location. Yeah. Or place. <laughs> price. Price happens to be one of the four P's. So price. So it doesn't have to start with a P? Uh, for the four P's it does. But for the lemonade? For lemonade, no. No rules with lemonade. So price is one. Um, diversification. So you, are, you offered Kool-Aid versus lemonade, or maybe you offered both, or maybe you, ordered, you offered a combo of Kool-Aid plus lemonade to make a new drink. Maybe you didn't, but there you go. So you're already, at a very young age, becoming a marketer. You're already beginning to think about how to market your product and or service. What does your stand look like? What did your stand look like? Was it a cardboard box? That's what mine was. Mine was a cardboard box. What about you, John? What was my table leg? Like? Yeah. Those white foldable ones. Oh wow! So you, so you, went inside, pilfered some of the mom and dad's card tables and things like that. Okay, that's interesting. What about the rest of you? Just my kitchen table. The kitchen table for my brother and mother. Okay, <laughs> that's pretty cool. And did you guys offer? Was it the summertime? Normally, it's around the summertime that people do lemonade stands. Did you all have ice? <laughs> no, forgot the ice. The Was it crushed ice? Had ice in the beginning. In the beginning. <laughs> right. And what did your signs look like? What was the signage like that kind of, did you attract anybody? Did anybody stop and hit the brakes? It was basic, uh, for sure. Basic. Right. Very basic. Um, 
did you, how did you package it? Did you pour it into a reusable glass or plastic cup or was it a paper Dixie cup that kind of fell apart? Were you ever thinking about costs? Most likely not. You made a good point about, you know, whether or not, you know, you really at that age don't have to worry about costs all that much. It's all pure profit. So whatever you could, you know, take out of mom and dad's cupboard um, and get people to stop, you know. I had one friend of mine who had a really cute puppy and she brought the puppy out to uh, be right next door to the lemonade stand and that got people to stop and they petted the puppy. That slowed them down just enough for them to say, oh, what are you selling here? Was so, that one of the peas? Puppy, yeah, right. So puppy is not one of the four P's. Puppy is not one of the four P's. These are my notes here. Um, puppy is not one of the four P's. But um, so you know, you could you could potentially, especially in this day and age, I want you to guys think a little bit more creatively about other attributes that you could incorporate into your lemonade stand that would get the right customers, older people, like parents who drive cars and have money, to stop and try your product. Did you package it in reusable or recyclable type containers, for example? Or was it in a glass? You know, that's one of the... So, I want you to remember that the lemonade stand is the one Thing that I think is almost universal for most people having had that experience and you start thinking about why somebody would stop at your lemonade stand why they would buy your lemonade over say somebody else's you're offering ice or crushed ice um, you're offering uh, packaging that's recyclable or reusable uh, you're offering some sort of other value added like Buy a lemonade, get a cookie. Especially if mom made them, you know. So when you think back to how do I become a really good marketer, I think the lemonade stand is the best tool for you to think about and remind yourself about um, in order to um, think about how you are going to bring your product to market. Anybody else think of any other kind of ideas that would set their lemonade stand apart? Say it's all natural. All natural, right. So like instead of using, I don't even know, what's the summertime lemonade or the, Minute Maid or something. what is it called? Minute Maid. Yeah, like Minute Maid or Tang. They still make Tang? Yeah. They do, yeah. So, you know, rather than using a powder, you know, you're maybe squeezing fresh lemons, all nat, or using an all natural mix. Homemade. Homemade. So homemade is a nice, nice little ring to it. The other thing too is, what, do, what do you and or your partner look like and how are you presenting that lemonade to your customers? Are, is your friend that's helping you putting his dirty hand into the bucket and mixing the lemonade with his hand? And, you know, having customers look at that and say, yeah, I don't think that's the lemonade I want. So, you know, how is that, how are you packaging, and that's a P, how are you packaging or presenting product? product packaging. How are you packaging that product? That's one of the P's and price is another. Um, and placement. So placement is another good one. So placement 
really is talking about where you set up your stand. Was it at the corner or was it in a place that, you know, was in between two cars? Was it visible? What was your location and how did you convey your product to to your customer? Did you put a beautiful, you know, bunch of flowers on the top of your lemonade stand? And did you offer it in a pitcher that was sweating, that looked cold and refreshing? Or was it just blank? And people had to wonder what the heck it was. Um, so placement is obviously one of the other, uh, one of the four Ps. And then how are you promoting it? So promotion. is another. Um, but getting back to the lemonade stand, what other things did you offer at your lemonade stand? And how did you determine what the price was? Did you just do, decide on it randomly? Five cents seems fair. Um, what, what did you do? Yeah. Lids and straws. Lids and straws is cool. So there's a nice idea because you're able to take it in your car and not spill it and yeah. kids in the back seat would be able to have it and there's a certain amount of uh, that <coughs> that that's 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 very cool. So lemonade stand I would argue is something that you should always keep in your back of the pocket and when anybody tries to overcomplicate marketing to you Think about the lemonade stand and think about what ways in which you could modify your lemonade stand to attract customers. Because ultimately it's all about how you're able to uh, make those customers stop, become aware of you, and make them uh, in a position to make a purchase. So that's... Um, that's a little bit of a very rudimentary marketing tool that I highly suggest you think about and focus on. Um, why is, I'm gonna leave brand here to, um, actually I, I think I'll, I'll go around the room and I'd like you all to write down right now on just a scratch piece of paper, the top four brands, your top four brands in anything, not your own company, not your own thoughts or business, but in the world. That we. I'll give you a hint. Apple would be a brand. <laughs> so is it the top four brands for us? For you. For, like for you. Of <laughs> top of mind. Okay. What are the top four brands? <laughs> Your top four brands. Like top four brands you like. Top four brands you like. Top four brands you that come to come to your mind. Okay, who's going to volunteer? How about you? What are your three brands? What is your name? Megan. Megan. Michael. Um, Apple. Yeah. American Eagle Outfitters, Starbucks, and Nutella. I think that's mm -hmm. Nutella. Yeah, isn't that the brand mm -hmm. name? Mm -hmm. I think so. Okay. Um, Do you want to erase the homework? If that's okay. Did everybody get the homework? Anybody not get it? Prepare I'll email a draft it to of you parts well. A, B, and C of your business plan, and email it to Alice by the end of the day on the twenty seventh. I once had a professor that used to write dates and stuff like that on the board and then erase it right away. So if you didn't get it, you didn't get it. And then if you ask the question, they'd throw the eraser at you. <laughs> I won't do that. Okay. So Nutella. Apple. Um, you said American Outfitters? American Eagle. 
American Eagle. Okay. And what was the other one? Starbucks. And Starbucks. Okay. You picked some big, big winners there. Okay. How about some others? Um, Apple, Tesla, and Google, and Samsung. I just bought a Samsung stove not too long ago. Not a Samsung phone, but I also have a Samsung phone. Um, Tesla, Google, Samsung, and what? I, she already has it up there. Apple. Okay, Apple, right? Okay. Yeah. Um, Microsoft and Nike. Okay. Microsoft, MSFT. That's their top stock ticker. <laughs> you should know it. <laughs> uh, what else? And Nike. I Nike, yeah, for sure. So Nike is one of those super power brands. A lot of these are super power brands, and I'm going to talk about that in a couple minutes. Uh, okay, next. Yep. Nike, Quicksilver, Apple, Adidas. Yeah, Quicksilver. Interesting. Okay, what was the other one? Um, Adidas and Nike. Adidas and Nike. Yeah. <laughs> Can we do non power brands? Absolutely. They're brands. We got koala tree, C O okay. A L A, like the animal and tree. Yeah. Um, feet socks, like feet as in F E A T, and recycled propaganda. my own heart. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, some of these aspiring brands. Okay, next, let's do just two more. Who else has a couple interesting ones? Yes, sir. Scotch. Scotch. Yep. Okay. G E. G E. <laughs> okay. Hopefully they're not a sponsor. John Deere. John Deere is a good one. Yeah, that's definitely one of those that kind of resonate. But at times maybe John Deere, definitely. Uh, Amazon is Supreme. What was the second one? Supreme. Supreme. Obviously, I'm not hip enough. <laughs> Supreme. Never heard of them. All right, Supreme. And the other one you just gave was what? Amazon. Amazon, yeah. So, Amazon. Mm hmm. And you said Amazon, not Amazon.com. So, their brand is getting through to you as Amazon, which is good. It used to be Amazon.com. All right, one more. Um, Ikea. Ikea, mm -hmm. very strong brand. Yeah, okay. McDonald's and KFC. Mm -hmm. Probably one of the most recognized brands in the world. Mm. Two, you um, had KFC. the others. KFC. KFC. I also said H&M And that's it? Which one? H&M. H&M. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Okay. What does that stand for? Do you know? Okay. Yep, it's a clothing department store. Yeah. Right? I'm surprised no one has said uh, Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola, one of the biggest, right? Coca-Cola is definitely one, of, one that's up there. N interesting that nobody said any drug companies. 
And if any of you watch television recently, the number of drug companies that are advertising is almost unbelievable. Um, but nobody said like Bayer aspirin or... Bayer is one of the sponsors of this program. Okay. Actually, Covestro, because oh, they're cool. in Sheffield. Oh, that's very cool. Yeah. Um, all right, so, you know, we have um, a lot of these, what I would put into the category, and they, they call them power brands. Uh, aspiring brands, I heard a few of those. Fading and new brands. I'm going to put a couple up there of my own. One, how about ragu? <laughs> okay, ragu. Uh, how about Campbell? I could even say Campbell's Chunky Soup. Right. Um, so the question really is, for all of these brands, and when you're thinking about building your own brand, brand is really important in marketing. In terms of your value and your perceived value, Nothing can be more important than the brand you're creating. And I don't care whether or not you're creating a lemonade stand or a lawnmower repair factory or a snow plowing company or a wool factory. I mean, it really doesn't matter. Uh, you should, in your business plan, think about what is this brand that you are going to be creating? Because the value of your company to yourself and to your customers is always going to come from brand. And brand is not built overnight, nor is it built by putting an ad on the Super Bowl. You can't build, and you've seen lots of companies who maybe raise a lot of money and spend a lot of money on advertising, try to build their brand by buying one ad on the Super Bowl. Uh, it might get your attention, but it, it's not gonna build your brand. That alone is not gonna build your brand. Over time, your, these brands have been built, not just through savvy marketing, not just through purchasing of advertising. It's had a lot more to do with the quality of the product, the perceived value of the product the amount of money they charge for the product, and whether or not consumers feel like the value ratio is there. How many people go to Starbucks, because that's one of them up there. Somebody said Starbucks, I think, right? Mm -hmm. Just pointed to it. Starbucks. So Starbucks approached the market pretty interestingly. Um, you'll always see various um, marketing courses and classes that talk about um, how Starbucks developed their business plan. And it started off with a very simple concept, which is how much was a cup of coffee before Starbucks was around? There was a time when it was 10 cents, but I remember 50 cents at least. I'm not, I'm old, but I'm not that old. <laughs> um, so, Starbucks approached this and said, no, we want to sell our product for $2.79 a cup. And they revolutionized, I'm going to do a terrible job at you know, 
whatever their logo is with the mermaid thing. Right? <laughs> you know, so they, they said, how are we going to sell a cup of coffee for 279 versus 50 cents? And it's one thing to do it once, but to get those customers to come back, to create the experience that Starbucks does, right? When you walk into a Starbucks, it's kind of cool. You drink out of that cup, it's almost like a status symbol. You feel good when drinking a cup of Starbucks. Many people do, not everyone. But their loyal customers definitely do. And they keep coming back. The cup kind of feels like it's worth a lot more than if you buy it at Dunkin' Donuts. Right? I mean, it's Dunkin' Donuts is a styrofoam <coughs> cup. Coffee has got a lot of caffeine in it, but does it make you feel better? I think some people might be loyal to those. Some Dunkin might Donuts. be more loyal to Dunkin' Donuts. And Dunkin' Donuts is an interesting uh, play on the whole coffee business. Well, we're not going to get into the details of all that. That's, you know, that's just touching the edge there a little bit. The, the brand asset valuator that Young and Rubicam spent 20 million, probably twice that, but about $20 million studying brands all over the world and deciding how people value them, consumers value them, how companies value them. Um, it comes down to this. So I'm saving you $20 million. And that is, it can be measured by brand stature on the one side, and brand stature, and we can talk a lot more about this, is esteem and knowledge. So for example, think of Starbucks. A certain amount of steam, there's a certain amount of knowledge that you know their coffee is free trade. I don't think Dunkin' Donuts says anything about free trade in any of their commercials. America runs on Duncan, right? We all know their tag. Um, I don't even know if Starbucks has a tag. But there's a certain amount of knowledge about where the coffee's coming from, and it's held in a certain amount of steam, and that's what builds brand stature. So anything moving out in this direction, okay, anything moving out in this direction is stature, brand stature. And on the vertical axis, Brand strength, okay? So brand strength is differentiation. So in what ways is your product differentiated from um, Cumberland Farms? I don't even know if that's how you spell Cumbie. Cumberland Farms, right? Cumberland Farms advertises, what, 99 cent cup of coffee, which is still pretty expensive for the, what it is. But, Cumbie has decided it's playing on price. Like, don't buy that expensive Starbucks stuff. I can save you a lot of money. The, our coffee is just as good. And uh, we use Green Mountain coffee. That's their. So, Cumbie versus Starbucks, brand strength, differentiation, and then. Um, I know you can't really read this. I probably should rewrite it. Um, Relevance? Yeah, so relevance. I'm not very good at writing vertically, but I'll, so I'll write it on like half. So relevance. Relevance is like how relevant how relevant you are, right? So when you when I think about ragu, for example, I think that there's a certain very high. Everybody knows it. they've heard of it, right? Um, it's not necessarily held in great esteem. And so it's probably down in here somewhere, if you were to graph it on this chart, right? So it's really well known. There's a certain amount of brand stature, actually brand, uh, la, 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 la. right, so down in here, brand stature, but there's not a lot of strength to the brand. They're like, you know, it's the cheap stuff. You can get 12 for 12 at your local supermarket. Uh, so it's really well known. There's a certain amount of knowledge. People don't hold it in high esteem. Um, 
it's not very differentiated, it's a commodity product, and um, it's not all that relevant to me. I get it because it's the cheapest thing. That's basically their customer base. And we can talk a little bit about this and how this is differentiated from Ragu a little later. Ragu is only just one of them. But it's an eroding, an eroding brand, right? Um, Samsung, Ikea, you know, Ikea and Apple, all of these, John Deere, are brands that have both a lot of esteem. People think, well, John Deere, it's, you know, it's the best. American made. And um, they're holding it in um, high regard and it's differentiated from the competition, even though, for those of you who are farming types, Kubota is quite a good competitor too. But Kubota's orange and John Deere's green. So there you go. And there's some differentiation, right? So, um, but you've got power brands and then you've got some of these as aspiring brands that might be really strong and they're appealing to a very, you know, small but passionate demographic like Koala Tree. I don't even know what that is. What do they do? Uh, apparel. Apparel, okay. They have t-shirts and they have a farm that they're supposed to go to. Yep, and so, and I, apo I apologize, I don't know Feet Sock either. They're just an up-and-coming brand from Amherst that I know. Okay, personally, so I and again, so here we have new brands, right? New brands um, that, I put this into the wrong spot before. Ragu is probably over here. I think it's fading. Fading brand. But new brands are kind of like fading brands because nobody really, you know, they don't have, and even within this box, Ragu is probably up in here more, and these other brands are just way down here. They just don't, nobody knows about them, you know? And for them to try to reach new audiences, um, you know, they have to invest in expanding knowledge about their brand even before they even start thinking about it. Esteem. They have to make people believe in it rather than people just believe in the power brands. Yeah, no and reason. go ahead. Yeah, that's very good. Exactly. And so they also have a challenge. I mean, they're, they're part of their marketing strategy is, you know, puts them into understanding what they need to do to eventually you know, become the next Nike or the next whatever quality is, you know, competing against, like Patagonia, for example, right? Patagonia would be a good example of a, a really strong brand that is held in high esteem. Everybody pretty much has heard about it. Some people make fun of it if it's not quite their market, Patagucci. But, you know, your, your understanding kind of where you need to go in this, um, in this pathway to developing a strong brand. Can I ask a question that you might get to later? Yeah. But what if you are a small business and your market is really small? Right. And you don't expect to become the next Apple or Patagonia. Right. So, for example, we had somebody uh, in on the board of directors at at Berkshires who is interested in starting a new business that helps um, weekenders essentially uh, manage their property okay and um, the individual asked me should I should I advertise on WAMC for example and I said well what how many how many properties can you actually manage and what is the number of, of properties that you need to manage, right? So before you, you know, kind of understand, you don't necessarily need to create a power brand like Nike across the United States or the world, intergalactic brands, um, but you want to emulate those within your own market. So you want to have high esteem, you want your brand to be created in high esteem and knowledgeable for the market that you're trying to address. Okay, And so 
if it's if you only need 10 properties okay versus selling a million units of widgets whatever it is you you determine you you need to know and this this directly comes back to the 4p and we're going to be getting into this in a little in a little bit but one of the most important things about marketing is understanding exactly what it is you're driving beyond brand okay so brand is clearly where you constantly will return to it's something that you constantly want to think about but um, you need to figure out exactly what the size of your market is and how much of it you need to sell in order to make a living out of it. So clearly in that business plan when you're coming up and I hopefully somebody else is talking about this and maybe it should have been done uh, a little bit earlier but a key factor of your business and the business plan is your sales strategy right so before you get to your marketing strategy you really need to figure out what your sales strategy is price is clearly a part of that but price as it relates to marketing is much more of a variable off of the price that you've set okay so your marketing plan is not going to determine what, what price you're going to be selling your products at you already want to try to determine your cost of goods or cost of services and whether or not you're say for example maybe thinking about a franchise like KFC <laughs> or McDonald's I mean maybe you're gonna create the next McDonald's <laughs> or the next uh, KFC or four guys burgers or whatever it might be <laughs> so franchise might be another way of you know understanding your sales strategy and that ultimately is going to impact your your marketing strategy so before we might have put the cart before the horse but sometimes it's really good to put the cart before the horse and that is you know already be thinking about how you're going to be marketing and selling this and clearly your sales price and your sales price versus the competition is going to put you into a position of determining what your marketing is going to be right so, my so we have, um, yep. we kind of reached a point where we should take a break soon. That'd be good. Okay. Then we'll get back to the four P's and do you want to take we'll a break after now? the break? Okay. Yeah. And talk about your business. And then we can also talk a little bit about Omas. Okay. Yeah. Okay, guys. All right. So, um, I hope I didn't lose any of you. Um, but I can't, I can't stress enough, you know, how important understanding brand strength and brand stature is even in the smallest case even if you've got even if you're just trying to get or reach 10 or 15 customers say you need only I've known I've known certain businesses where they only needed two customers okay what a marketing challenge that is but in many instances you're probably going to be having a somewhat of a little bit of larger market for your product um, no matter whether or not you're as I said if you're starting a, a snow plowing business or a, a service business that manages <coughs> people's properties or you're creating a, a physical good um, ultimately the strength of your brand is always something that's going to be improving in value over time and you always want to think about in all of your marketing activities how you're building the esteem of your brand knowledge of your brand to your target market um, how are you becoming more relevant to them and that is what's going to make you and your product or service a much stronger business so you don't need to necessarily be you know create the next nike uh, or the next apple but keep in mind what some of those powerful brands do and it certainly will help you in your other marketing activities if strengthening your brand continues to be that one um, part of your business that you constantly are trying to reinforce and think about in every aspect of your marketing strategy that you're coming up with and when you're thinking about your marketing strategy as I said 
I wish somebody told this to me many years ago. Uh, it's a very old, uh, the four P's is a very old system for, for thinking about marketing. And um, if you can remember the four P's, price, product, placement, and promotion, you'll pretty much cover almost all of the bases of what your marketing strategy needs to do. When I say pricing, and we talked about that just a little bit before, your sales strategy and your cost of goods or services created is going to drive what you need to sell your product for. Many times, traditionally, that is 50% uh, over what your cost of goods sold is. And your cost of goods is, in the case of my business, for example, um, cost of goods incorporates your packaging, which in our case is lids, labels, and jars. The cost of uh, labor, whatever labor is necessary to make your product. Your rent, or if you own your own place, your mortgage, whatever it might be, whatever you need to cover in terms of where you're making or producing this service. And um, in my case, it's ingredients, but what other things, what other, what other uh, costs are involved in uh, developing your business? Does, you had mentioned that you're, you're pretty close on determining what your business might be. What, what was your general idea? Uh, I've got one, but so I can answer that. Shipping, marketing, as in like stickers, stuff like that, flyers, um, I guess advertising if we use Facebook, things like that. And the product is what? Um, it's a brand, apparel brand. Apparel. Like okay. The hat he's wearing, for example. Yeah, okay. And the shirt as well. Got it. Okay, so in that instance, what is the cost of design, right? What is the cost of your materials, your hats? What are you buying them for? What are you buying your t-shirts for? Um, that all goes into your cost of goods sold, and that basically is determining your sales price and your overall, the price you want to get for your product. Um, in determining your price in terms of marketing, that much more focuses on what sort of discounts you'd be able to offer at any certain time in order to match what other brands like Koala Tree might be doing. If you notice, are they offering, you know, 25% off, you know, quarterly or even twice a year. So in your case, you know, price for the four Ps is deter determining, okay, you know what you need to sell your product for, the price at which you're able to discount the product is really what this marketing price is talking about. Yeah. Um, the product itself is how you're packaging it. So um, what, what are your uh, various attributes to the product and how are you differentiating it, say, from quality or other brands? How are you making it stand out? Right. Um, we use uh, there's plastic poly like sleeves for shipping T-shirts and boxes for the hats and both of them are totally recycled materials. Okay, so for example, there's a new sock company out, right? That's called what? The mm -hmm. Socks for Life or something like that, right? You might be aware of them. Feet socks. Is what I was okay, so feet about. socks might be one of those, and um, basically, I think they're what twenty-five or thirty-dollar socks, yeah. but when they wear out or if they do, you can send them in and get a replacement. Darn so, so that's an example of a price marketing strategy that obviously takes into effect you know, what you really need to sell the product for. But in their case, they're selling essentially $10 socks for triple the cost in hopes that those that do wear out their socks don't ask for another pair, although they guarantee it, right? That's, that's a very good example of a, um, a price strategy and a overall product strategy for how they're positioning their product in the marketplace. They don't guarantee that they're not gonna wear out, but they guarantee that they'll replace them when they do. 
Michael, could, we, uh, could I ask you to talk about your business mm -hmm. and go through these, talk yeah. about your business? So, for example, our price, the price of this jar, it's a 16 ounce jar of um, high quality marinara sauce that's made um, by us in Cummington, Massachusetts in a decommissioned elementary school. Um, we rent a school that was decommissioned from uh, the Central Berkshire Regional School District, and we actually make our product by hand there using very high quality ingredients. We determined very early on that we couldn't compete with the ragu, uh, that we weren't going to make a billion jars a second. And we also wanted to differentiate our product in the marketplace from all the other sauces because we felt like there wasn't a sauce in the market that tasted anything like homemade. Uh, I grew up in an Italian-American family, and the sauce my grandmother, Uma, made was absolutely delicious. And she came from a part of Italy where marinara sauce originated. So this is the closest thing to the real thing you can get in a jar. Uh, the New York Times reviewed our product and said a jar of marinara sauce couldn't taste closer to homemade than this one. Um, we have other attributes that you know, from other press uh, contacts that have said similar things. And so we're standing out in the marketplace by creating a sauce that tastes like homemade. Most jarred sauces don't. We also go to um, an amazing level of um, processing. We use very high quality ingredients all grown in the United States of America. And for example, one of the differentiators is this. You can pass that around. That is uh, seed, stem, and peel. We actually start off with whole plump tomatoes and we take out the seed, stem, and peel so you're getting just the heart of the tomato and its juice and that does two things. It uh, helps to make the sauce uh, sweeter without adding any sugar and it makes it infinitely more digestible. So uh, the seeds of a plump tomato are really brittle. They're like little stones and uh, if you, even if you chop them up to smithereens your stomach will still identify it as a seed and cause your stomach to produce more acid than necessary. And so if you remove the seeds, you're removing that reaction your body has to, to the product. So that's one of the areas of differentiation from virtually all the others uh, in the marketplace. The price of that, this jar, is, um, is $7.99, and our large jar sells in most stores for $9.99. We currently have um, uh, a promotion going on at Whole Foods in Hadley, for example, and here at Guido's in Great Barrington and Pittsfield tomorrow, where I will be uh, dishing out a little bit of sauce to customers, um, where there's an a price incentive. So we drop the price of the sauce, uh, we promote it. In the case of Whole Foods, we were able to negotiate a wall of sauce. No, the Mexicans are not paying for it. <laughs> Uh, in the foyer of Whole Foods Hadley. And so if you're a shopper there, and a regular shopper there, for the entire month of February, you have to basically move your cart around our wall of sauce in order to, um, in order to get into the store. <laughs> so there's a, there's a good example of a way in which we've promoted it. Um, and all of these things, these are sometimes known as the four Ps the, the mixing four Ps, because each one of these may, may in fact mix with each other. So placement is really important. When I used to work for ESPN, the leader in sports, we always used to pay the cable providers a little bit more to put ESPN, News, The Deuce, which is ESPN2, and Classic all next to each other on the guide. So you'll notice some other networks have uh, a channel at 100, another one at 300, and if you like one of those channels, you have to know the other number and go surfing around to find it. We actually paid for placement so that ESPN, Deuce, News, and Classic were all right next to each other. So they were only one click away. That had tremendous impact on ratings and other, and revenue. Um, so placement is really important. In our case, Omotosoro's marinara sauce um, we want to be at chest high, not too high, not too low, 
clearly not on the bottom shelf. But we want to be about chest high um, in on the on the store shelf. So we actually recommend and negotiate our positioning and placement of our sauce on the shelf in, in most cases. We're not always successful, but we that's a key factor to, to our overall marketing strategy is where we're placed and who we're placed next to, what competitors we're placed next to. Does that to. also, like if you're thinking about the lemonade stand, does placement talk about where you set up? Are Absolutely. you at a busy intersection or are you exactly. on some back road or something? In each case, that's why the four P's are almost universal. You can start thinking about these and be like, <coughs> okay, um, for example, we um, set up a food vendor ship at Mass Mocha during bluegrass and coming this fall, Solid Sound. Anybody going to Solid Sound? Mm -hmm. So we determined that that venue is a good place for us to reach our target market. They're hope for a whole bunch of reasons but our placement within the venue is also important and we don't just accept wherever they place us we think strategically about where we're placed who's next to us um, and how that's going to play into our overall marketing strategy and, and how we're going to be promoted are we going to be included in and have our logo included in various marketing materials. Will we be mentioned in um, radio advertising that mentions Solid Sound? Um, will we be um, put into the brochure so that when people are like, oh, what food vendors are here, they recognize the Matosoros and realize what we're all about and what we do. So, um, so each one of these is very much a mix but if you remember the four P's, a lot of times, if you're thinking just about your product, your product design, um, the way you're packaging it, um, you, all, you already begin and are influenced by some of these other factors like placement and promotion. For example, if you were creating a, a say your clothing example, you know, the way that the hat or t-shirt is packaged or hung within the store is going to have a key either attribute or like limitation on where somebody could actually hang or place this. So do you know the effectiveness of the, it being placed right here versus down there to the point where you can actually negotiate it to where it's exactly for you? We do. And so. so we've shown them, we get data back, just our own sales data, and analyze where we're doing better and it's not only and always a, a pure science, a little bit of an art, because um, we may be doing better in some stores, for example, because the demographics of those stores are much more favorable or simply that the size of the market is that much larger. So we sell a heck of a lot more sauce at Whole Foods in Boston than we do at uh, you know a smaller mom and pop store of very high quality somewhere in the Berkshires, which you know, we enjoy being a part of, but um, it's not quite apples and oranges. It's not always apples and oranges, but clearly all of these four Ps you want to be able to measure in sh some way, shape, or form. Do they drive, you know, for example, our, our, um, our food vending uh, location at Mass Mocha this past fall was at Bluegrass. We also did the Bru Bluegrass Festival, which is in the fall two years in a row, and last year was 66% higher sales than last year. Okay, so we track all of that stuff. Our placement was way better, okay? We were in kind of a tough to see place the first year, but we still were considered successful enough to warrant them putting us in a higher, more profile uh, location. So and so you track that kind of information. How many people, how many emails did you get from you being on the corner in GB, you know, peddling your wares. How many people indicated that they would be willing to share this idea with a friend? Or did you give them a coupon to pass on to a friend to get 10% off their first purchase of a hat, for example? So we have to wrap up. Yep. Um, could you maybe make any last points you want to make, but also yep. tell us in a couple 
sentences about your target market? Sure. Um, our target market, um, I'll start and work my way back. Our target market um, has changed over uh, time. You know, initially we when did focused you start on. Your when did you, start, did you start your business? We started it in November of 2009. Yeah, so it has been seven years and it feels like two. Um, it's that riveting, it's that exciting. Um, I've never been in a position where I wake up in the morning and I'm more psyched to, um, to work. Um, I have a great feeling about getting up every day and going out and making, delivering, selling, marketing our soft. Um, it really, that, that entrepreneurial drive that some of you um, have indicated that you have inside of you and want to, trying to foster is, is really a, a wonderful thing. And it's kind of the, the greatest thing about our country is the ability for somebody to just think off the top of their head in terms of what they might want to do and then be driven by that rather than uh, you know carrying a briefcase to an office every day. I mean, that's for some people, and there's a certain amount of uh, security with that. I think a lot of people ask me, you know, wow, you must be really uh, into risking a lot. Um, and actually, I'm very risk adverse. But I guess there's a certain amount of um, a leap of faith that you need to take as an entrepreneur to go for what it is you want. And at some point in time, um, when you're mulling around these ideas about your brand and about how you're going to market it, how you're going to package it, price it, where you're going to get placement for it, how that's going to drive your sales numbers, um, you're going to come down to one it's hard for me to, to, to even describe it, but um, you're going to come down to um, this leap of faith, this knowledge or uh, confidence that you have that you can do it and that you can make it and that you can um, have enough tenacity to keep going when times are really hard, uh, especially in the very beginning, in order to get traction and then reap the benefits of, of your small little pieces of success and start patching those together um, that ultimately give you that support and success. Um, and not all of your businesses will succeed and you have, an, you have to have an ability to know as well when to cut it off and move on to something else. That's also um, a very important part of an entrepreneur's you know, most entrepreneurs start five to ten businesses. And half the businesses that are started, you probably have given the statistic, have failed. So um, that fear of failure, I think, is what drives a lot of people as well. Um, but if you have a good product and you've thought about this and you've put it down on paper, I think one of the other little tidbits I can give you, not just our marketing strategy, but every little aspect of it, our sales strategy, our product packaging, our, our uh, strategy in the channel to determine what stores we were going to focus on and where we were going to be first and how we would roll that out, um, is really important for you to put down on paper. It, it, it really, um, I cannot stress how important it is for you to do that and your your business model, I would highly s suggest you, you take this to heart as well. Your business model and business plan will be constantly evolving, constantly evolving. And you're gonna constantly be working on it and referring back to it. I would say you should do it at least quarterly. And in the very beginning, probably a little bit more than that. You really need to express and force yourself to write down where I'm going to price this, how I'm going to discount it, how I'm going to package it, what is the placement going to be, how am I going to promote it, and um, those types of things. And by writing that information down, 
you'll be able to refer back to it, scrap it, or rewrite it, and write a new chapter in, in your company's evolution and uh, history. But if you keep these ideas, these are the four things that will definitely keep you guided in the right direction. Remember the lemonade stand because nothing gets simpler than that. And if you can always think about how can I, maybe not necessarily create a power brand, but how can I um, build my brand into the, in the eyes of my targeted market um, as much as possible. And then for 30 seconds, the target market, okay, our target market was um, initially um, people who were high-end customers who had um, an ability to purchase our product because it's it's not a bargain basement, you know, it's not 12 for 12, it's, it's $6.99 and our larger regular size 26 ounce jar is about 10 bucks, $9.99 in most cases. So we knew that we had to reach a market that um, understood the the benefit of having a jarred sauce that tastes like homemade, unlike any other jarred sauce out there, um, and had the ability to afford it. So those were the kind of markets that we were looking for at first. Places like Guido's. So Guido's had a very high standard for what sort of products they would let in. Uh, Whole Foods Market does the same. There's there there's a entire hit list at Whole Foods Market of ingredients that they don't sell. If you have it in the product, they're not gonna sell. It has to be pure, natural, and organic, and no funny business. There's no um, you know, preservatives, no other artificial anything in, in all of the products they sell. So um, as far as the target market was concerned, we wanted to start um, with solidifying a sustainable, creating sustainable consumer demand in the types of markets like Guido's that we identified. And they were a small list of stores. And once we got shelf space there, we went in, we advertised, we demoed and sampled. Sampling was, has been a very important part of our overall marketing strategy is um, the big car companies, and I, this is 30, if I need five more seconds, please yield. Um, the car companies say you need to get butts into seats. Right? You can't sell a car unless you get a butt into, into the seat. You gotta get the guy to drive that Corvette and take it out of the driveway or the Ford 150 or whatever it is. You need to get their butts into seats to get them to buy that car. We need to get sauce into people's mouths to get them to see the difference and differentiation of our product. Once they try it, they buy it. So I hope that helps. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. And I'm here to uh, you know help and talk talk about uh, the, your projects uh, for the remainder of whatever time we have. Thanks.